Joined now by NHL insider Frank Saravelli of the Frankly Speaking podcast and the Daily Faceoff. You were in Seattle for the Board of Governors meeting, Frank, and uh, the commissioner is poo-pooing the 2026 Winter Olympics. We're all very sad here. They're not ready, Matt. They're not ready. And so it begins. Yes. So is it posturing, or do you think this is real and the commissioner still wants to uh, go without the Olympics? Well, I think both things can be true at the same time, right? Mm -hmm. Like the arena can actually be a real issue. Mm -hmm. And the NHL, if you squint just hard enough, you can see them beginning to crack the door open as a reason for potentially not going. And then they can throw their arms up in the air and say, hey, hey, this wasn't us. It's because Milan couldn't get their stuff together, those damn Italian construction workers. Mm -hmm. And I can say that. Because I'm Italian and my family works in construction. <laughs> but um, that's that's kind of where they're at is you see them open that door. It's 2023. The Olympics are in 2026. And I get the timeline. Like, I think that's a real thing. But to begin to point that out now it, and, and kind of ma- massage that message, if you mm. will, over the course of his press conference. Do, do you know who's that, more concerned than Gary Bevan about this, guys? The IOC. Like, that's their business. Like, And when's the last time you saw an Olympic Games not ready? They're always super scared. Matt knows this. I'm always on Olympic scare alert. Blake is the biggest Olympic alarmist going. Because I mean, we see games. this with the World Cup too. Like, yes, they they're they're like putting the finishing touches on the stadium as like the national anthems are being played every time. Like it's like he's never been in this universe before. I, I just don't get it. I actually thought the insurance issues and the families and all of that, and of course it goes unsaid. But you know how red will be the carpet you roll out for our governors? I think those are actually the bigger issues. They the actually got those sorted out for the most part. And that's the funny thing is they've they've hammered out a lot of these issues that have typically been roadblocks. It's like okay, insurance, travel, accommodations for players, accommodations for their families. He's not concerned about that and acknowledge that he isn't concerned about that. So then, okay, cross that off the list of the playbook for reasons for the NHL to not be happy with the situation. Oh, okay, we can add in, hey, there is no arena. But then the next thing might be, which we haven't gotten now, and it's always less of a complaint when you play it in Europe as opposed to Asia, which is, oh, this is a huge disruption to our season. Yeah. That part Eastern... doesn't seem to be talked uh, about. It was like, well, we yeah. can't go to Beijing because it's a huge disruption to our season. And now it's like, oh, it's in Italy. That's great. Let's do it. Mm. It's all pretty rich for me. It's almost as though they want you to forget about the Olympics and imbue their tournament with some sort of meaning. Well, they do <laughs> want you to do that, but... More Meaning than that, that, hockey fans have been hesitant to give them uh, in the head-to-head comparison versus the Olympic tournament and gold medal. So you can say what you will about Gary Bettman and his business posture, the lockouts. You could, if you're a Canadian fan and you want to say that Gary Bettman doesn't like Canada, whatever charge you have against him, I think the biggest stain on his resume is the fact that we will have gone 12 years at the very least between international best on best play with some of the best talent the game has ever seen yes. right yes a generation that we haven't seen Absolutely. in years and, the, and we're not doing this with, with and, that and here's the thing for i don't want to single him out by the way because i think don fear and the nhl players association owns a lot of that as well That's a huge problem. Well, and the governors as well. Like, you know, we would hear, and particularly from American markets, that, oh, that that really disrupts their ability to sell tickets uh, taking that break. I just, it's just all sounded like excuse making to me over the years. And you're absolutely right about the collection of talent right now and being able to see it best on best. And Connor McDavid's going to be 28. Yeah, 28. That's such and a he's crime. never and put on a Team Canada best on best jersey. And here's the thing. <laughs> That's Frank. a crime. That's criminal. It it's just unbelievable. And here's the thing, Frank. Based on the state of Canadian goaltending and where Team USA is at center, 
Y'all have uh, a the chance Hughes, this time the Hughes around. family. I don't know if you guys yeah. have heard of them. Yeah, you guys uh, have a chance this year. I mean, it's going to be a good game. Team, team it's USA's never been right. a better time to be an American hockey fan. No. Yeah. And you don't, you, your country has never even seen it come together because they've had no chance to. There's, mm-hmm. you, you can't get fans behind a, a mythical team that you can only talk about in roster projections. Why are they going to do this four team thing? Like, like that's not going to scratch the itch, though. Like, what's the well, what are they... a little bit? It will. To, oh, to oh. you could potentially have the U.S. and Canada play each other three times. Yeah, just do that though. In like, a week, like, like that would be better. Give the Euros all the week off, and let's just go Canada and the U.S. That to me, yeah, sounds interesting. Play best of five. I, I would play it at Canada U.S. seven game series. Yeah, so, can you imagine? Yes. It would be huge. Yeah, and it, I, I get where they're at on that front, though, because this is the appetizer to get back into into international hockey, and I like it because Sweden and Finland made a stand, and they said. In no uncertain terms, if Russia participates, we're out. Hmm. And so with that said, the league couldn't possibly then invite Russia to participate if they wanted to do a sort of mini World Cup, a an, an entree back into this. They had to change it up. And this four-team tournament, as unsatisfying as it might be, you at least, especially if you play the Sweden-Finland games in one of those countries or potentially in both of those countries before then coming over to North America, you at least get that side of the world interested in this little tournament, whatever you call it. Right. Yeah. 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 That could, that could work. Uh, Salary cap. Anybody disappointed profoundly by that, or is it still good enough for that? uh, Everybody feels okay about it. I don't, I don't think there's anything to feel one way or the other about it. This is, quite literally just the formula that's been on a piece of paper since June of 2020. If you've paid off the debt that was $1 billion that ballooned to north of that from players to owners, then the cap goes up 5%. It's at 83.5 right now. 5% on top of that is 4.2 million, which gets you to 87.7. I mean, it's, it's as clean as that. There's nothing to be happy or sad about i think the real question is does the league and the players association come together and negotiate a larger increase than that they should have done that last summer i believe mathematically and the way the system works that there was a way to increase the salary cap more than one million dollars without touching the escrow withholding percentage that players had agreed to but the league wanted something in return, and that was it. They wanted the escrow cap to be moved up. And players are like, we structured all of our contracts based on knowing that for this three-year period of time, escrow is capped at 6%. There's no chance we're giving that up. Even if it means more jobs, even if it means more money in the system, we we negotiated that, and this is what this is our payoff for it. Might they negotiate for more this summer? They should. There's yeah. a way to do it. You got to get comfortable. You got to give something up. You got to be ready mm. to to go back and forth because, as we know, the NHL doesn't give you anything for free. No, It's in their own best interest as a league to further have salaries suppressed like they are right now. Well, they sure have because even at 87-7, there's two basketball players in Milwaukee who make more than that combined. And the bottom line here, Gary, that... It, not to cut you off, but it, if the cap was actually relinked to revenue right now this season, let alone next year and a projection, this year would be $93 million. Mm. So bottom line, Gary took his mm. salary cap increase and went home. He said, nope, you're not bottom getting Bottom line is, and no one says this out loud, this, is, this current pandemic era CBA – is by far Gary Bettman's best work. <laughs> it is legitimately, and, and I say this knowing that he negotiating down to a 50-50 split in 2012-13, I did the math. It's brought NHL owners in the last 10 years an additional $4.3 billion in their pocket. Mm. And I'm telling you that that is second to how long a period of time that the NHL will have artificially suppressed player earnings in this period 
by keeping the salary cap as low as it is. Do you think Marty Walsh will uh, will be able to get s- uh, some expansion money the next time that happens? I mean, I don't want to say never because, I mean, you never know what happens, but I kind of feel like I have as good a chance getting pregnant. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and if Aaron, you look at me, you might say I already am. So what's the difference? <laughs> Aaron Portsline in Columbus last night tweets, Fantelli, if, uh, Adam Fantilli plays 10 minutes and 11 seconds. Ken Johnson, 8 minutes, 8 seconds. David Yerichek, 10 minutes, 25. A lost season at some point have to turn it over to the kids. Is it a shorter list to say who isn't available in Columbus than who is available? And at some point, does ownership or the general manager step in here and get this new coach playing the kids? Uh, I, I don't, I honestly, I, I don't even know what to say. That's how much of a mess it is there. And I see Yarmo Kekaline and there he is at the board of governors meeting, you know, learning about AI and the economic state of the game. It kind of felt like, was it Nero that was playing the fiddle as Rome was burning? I mean, why, what's going on here? Mm-hmm. Why is the third longest tenured GM in the league who has won one playoff series? Why is he immune to any sort of blowback or someone making a move? Is the ownership in Columbus that hands off that they're not watching this absolute car crash of a season? I can't understand it for the life of me what's happening there because You've drafted some really special players. You you mentioned Johnson and Fantilli, and they've botched the development path of Sillinger. And you look at Yerichek and the logjam of defensemen that he's had to play behind this season while they're playing Bokvist and Peak 23 and 26 minutes a night. I don't know about you guys, but I'm watching the New Jersey Devils. Simo Nemitz has played two games this season. And he supplanted Luke Hughes in ice time last night by five minutes. The number two overall pick. Like, if you've got special players, put them in a position to succeed. You cannot pretend, as Aaron Portsline was saying, that this season is still about this season for a team that had playoff hopes. Half the time, they don't even look like they care to be at the rink. And I'm not entirely sold Patrick Laine even likes hockey watching him play this year. So you add all those things up and you say, well, who isn't available? My question would be, you've got your young players that you can park. And it's nice that they have someone like Denton Matechuk that's uh, back playing in junior and is not involved in this mess. But who would want most of these guys? They're not actually going to trade Kent Johnson, are they? Like I saw some talk about that chitter chat. That's just fan driven stuff. They're not actually thinking about that, are they? If that were the case, I've already stated that Yarmo Kekalainen deserved his walking papers back in September before the season started. When you had such a critical hire for Mike Babcock and you botched that, and this was all about trying to make the playoffs this season, and now you've got your new coach in Pascal Vincent who seems exasperated at every turn. If that's it seems like fantasy talk, but if that were even a twinkle in someone's eye in the Columbus front office, that should be their last twinkle that they see in there. Yeah, no more twinkles. Mm-hmm. You're out of twinkles. <laughs> uh, the goaltender market is Jake Allen now uh, available because of the extension for Montembeau in Montreal, and is it Seattle and Jersey that are most off or uh, most uh, after goaltending right now? That's I think the plan is for Jake Allen to to find him a landing spot. I think the Canadians know that this three goalie setup can't continue any longer. Caden Primo has gotten his game together. Clearly with the extension, they're believers in Montembeau. And if you look at the age structure and scheme of this team, Allen is one of those guys that's the outlier. But teams really like him because not only does he have tons of experience, more than 400 NHL games, He's also developed a reputation league-wide as being a great teammate and someone that whoever he's playing in tandem with loves having him as a partner. I can't say how important that is when you're thinking about bringing a goaltender into a mix mid-season. 
it's not always an easy thing to assimilate. And I think with Allen, it kind of becomes a non-starter and a given of, hey, this is what's going to happen when you bring him in. I wouldn't say the list is limited to just those two teams because he also felt like a fit for Edmonton. Although I still think even as rough as Jack Campbell's AHL outing was the other night with a couple of the goals he gave up, I think they have to give him one more chance to at least kind of rule that out that he can't be an in-house solution before you have to go and pull the trigger on something else. I know Matt wants to ask you about defensemen too, but let's tie it back to the Canucks here for a second Mm -hmm. here. Um, They go get Nikita Zadorov, and he's sort of like a younger, more mobile, and more physical Tyler Myers, whom they also have. Myers had a tough outing. Myers has tough outings. He, I think they have similar poor decision-making at times, the two big men. But they upgraded that big man spot. Do, do you think they have the appetite to hold on to Myers the entire season? In, in your talks with the like, do they glow about him? Do you, do you think that's one piece where they might be able to move that cap number out to improve, well, improve the club, but more specifically the right side of the defense? I I don't get the sense that they glow about him. I also don't get the sense that they're as negative about his game as the fan fan base might anticipate. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's a really delicate dance to be able to pull off what you're talking about. And personally, like, first off, I I don't think they're a match to play with each other. Like, that's not, that's not what I would do. No. Um, But more than that, um, I think it's really a depth and numbers issue. Like if you're to take Tyler Myers out of the mix, how much worse does that make again, not knowing what you get back in return, but how much worse does that make your, your defense core top to bottom? If you take out a guy that whatever you think he is a four or five, and then try and fit in someone or shoehorn in someone else, unless it's a clear upgrade, it kind of feels like you're moving the deck chairs around a little bit just to do it. And stylistically, that might be a better fit. But when you look at the injuries that the Canucks have run into this season, and I made the point, you know, on last week's show when talking about the addition of Zadorov, is the, fir- the first thing you want to avoid is having fringe NHLers in your lineup. Mm-hmm. The Julesons and the and the and every game that, you know, without McWard and every game without those guys in the lineup that the Canucks can play is you're that much closer to a win. And I'm not knocking them saying they can't, you know, grow or compete or whatever it might be. And sometimes you have to play those guys because that's life in the NHL. That's how it works. But to, to ship out Myers and to try and find a better fit right now, it, it would be incredibly hard to do. However, I will give you a preview on a column I'm writing for later this week, which is, I think Patrick Alvine is the front runner for GM of the year through yep. the first quarter of the year. Yep. And you look at I, how hard it was to make trades, Frank. And I'm trades so season. tired of hearing about it. Yep. When when you've got one guy that's made five out of the last eight trades in the league, and everyone else wants to complain about, oh, there's no cap space, no one wants to trade. Find ways to make something happen. Be aggressive. And I love, love, love that Alvin has gone out there and said, I, I, it, it, you may not see the complete picture right now, but I'll get there and you'll see it, you know, after they get the cap space from Beauvillier, they were obviously already working on Zadorov. It took a couple of days to pull it off, but then you start to see the picture come together more clearly. And they, ha- for all the criticism that the Canucks fan base gave, and some of it at times, rightfully so, what is the plan? Yep. The Canucks very clearly have one, and I'll tell you what it is. It's stacking up incremental 5% wins on top of each other, on the margins, to try and improve this team at a time when everyone else is sitting back on their hands saying, oh, man, it's so hard to make trades. That's exactly what they're 100% doing. right. Yeah, 100% right. Uh, Toronto was in on Zadorov. Is Chris Tanev going to wind up in his hometown as a Maple Leaf? He very well could. Um, I think that's the the that was the number one priority for the Leafs in talking trade with the Calgary Flames. Yes, they wanted to try and get both guys, but really what they were looking for was a reliable, steady piece in Tanev that they could count on. Zadorov was just a nice piece to add in as a different element 
They view him as a third pair guy. I think that could, you know, maybe just change things up a little bit. Um, I still think there's a, a strong chance that they revisit it given this is going to go back to what I was just saying, given how few defensemen are actually available on the market that he kind of sticks out as an, as an easy fit for Toronto who's still waiting for a little clarity on John Klingberg, but the goal for them, no matter what, whether it's in two separate deals or one is to try and get two defensemen to beef up their lineup instead of just one. Lastly, we saw what you tweeted about Broberg in Edmonton. Is that just a function of not having time to bleed? Got to be able to salvage this season. Got to be able to help goal prevention. And if it means a former top 10 pick, so be it. They're willing to trade him. Yeah, I think it's kind of devolved to a spot where the players had a crisis of confidence. You've got two different coaching staffs who clearly don't trust him. And no one has any rope right now to figure out if this can be salvaged. I think the real story on Philip Broberg is not that he's a failed top 10 pick. It's more so that he's just more or less an unknown still. He's untested in that you can't really expect someone to be good if they're healthy scratched for 60% of their games on the roster. How do you expect anyone to generate any confidence? And now with every game, every night mattering for the Oilers, this is there's no developmental league to just say, hey, you know what? We're going to play seven defensemen and we're going to try and wedge him in there for extra time. Or how about, hey, Brett Kulak, you sit out for the night so that Philip Broberg can somehow search in the muck and find his confidence. It's not going to happen. And the player has grown frustrated and clearly wants out and they're trying to facilitate it. Yeah. It's just, we they, were they want something specific. We, we were looking, he's played 14 games this year. He played 62 games last year. He played 54 games the year before. I mean, just look at the totality of games that have been left on the table that this guy hasn't played as they tried to develop him as a young defenseman and as we know another lesson it's not a developmental league he should have been Mm -hmm. developing somewhere else great stuff frank uh catch some rest after that red eye from seattle we'll catch up next friday have a good one guys this clip brought to you by the vgh millionaire lottery order now for your chance to win one of 10 grand prizes for tickets go to millionaire